hopefully this won't hey uh good morning everybody ken at tortoise capital uh this is the creativity 202 check-in for lesson four charlie um this is march 3rd no i'm sorry march 19th 2023 and um i'm gonna uh start with a quick check-in uh with ernie how are you doing sir very well thank you beautiful day here in st charles missouri and uh Looking forward to a good lesson. Sounds good. Uh, Jeff? Uh, nice. It's sunny out, but cold. We were below freezing last night, which is a notable event where I live. None of our infrastructure is actually built for cold temperatures like some of the people up north experience. But great day. Um, yeah, that's about it. Awesome. Uh, good morning, Chun Long. How are you, sir? Hey, good morning. Very well. Uh, nice weather. It's a real spring now. The snow almost smell away. I hope. Um, let's see. We're we're doing okay here. Uh, we're getting ready to drive to Pittsburgh um, on Tuesday. Let's see, uh, soccer practice for the little kids starts outdoors tomorrow. So I hope the snow melts. Mm -hmm. um, and games this weekend. They're driving to Pittsburgh for the um, Association of Business Simulations and Experiential Learning, uh, where I'm doing a workshop and a um, keynote speaker speech on, oddly enough, creativity and teaching creativity to adults and uh, what we've learned about it so far. So I'm excited about that. And um, I, I, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll save my my comments for for my true story for work in progress and whatnot. But uh, it'll be on a coaching program. Uh, I had a uh, moment of zen on how to do that correctly, and uh, I'll talk about that here uh, when it's my turn. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and move us into the. Uh, into the sacred circle, and um, we'll uh, we'll get started. This week's lesson, for those of you on lesson four, was um, win this battle, not the last one, using the reference of Hannibal, and then a visual visualization about um, uh, about the zero state. Our introduction to that concept. So, looking forward to your stories with anticipation here we go Welcome, Ken. In whenever you're, whenever you're ready on for your story, just go ahead and give us your your check in at that time. We're, we will uh, we're going to drive on right through to the uh, uh, to the little true stories. So, so here we go. Ernie. Oh, uh, let's see. One of my discoveries about this course is that there are threads that connect the lessons. Now, I don't always see them right away, and I'm sure that there are many that I don't even see at all. Uh, but when I go back and reflect on the lessons and on the responses that everyone has provided, I gain more insight and I start to envision another pathway to take. Um, and as usual, uh, everyone really killed it last week with the responses to uh, creativity, compliments, compliance. And I felt that the questions that were part of the uh, trader exercise were pretty good. But I casually went through them um, while I did the lesson. Um, but in listening to the other group, I noticed that uh, Luke wrote down his responses. And he applied some of those questions to his actual trades last week. 
And he took the questions very seriously, as opposed to uh, my casual <laughs> glancing over them and everything. So I took another look at the questions last week, and, and I realized that there was some serious stuff there. Um, and I'm going to go back over them again. And I'm going to I'm going to go through that and write down those things and uh, and take it serious this time. And I want to get myself some serious answers to those questions, uh, because I really did see the value um, in that, that I didn't see it at first. And uh, uh, I'm glad that I noticed that Luke had written down his responses and that he really took the time to do that. And so I'm kind of embarrassed that I didn't do that. Um, so this week's lesson, win this battle, not the last one. Um, I'm about to complete a major battle in my life. I've been taking physical therapy for a year after my spinal fusion surgery, and I'm getting close to finishing the uh, physical therapy. And last week, um, during the therapy, I was, well, I've been talking to my therapist about uh, my investing, and I've been talking about the creativity course and true storytelling. Um, we enjoy talking about it. And uh, so we were walking, um, and she's she's pretty neat. Uh, she'll put two fingers on my shoulder, you know, and that means stand up straight, um, keep your head up, walk right. Um, she'll tap me on the left hip, uh, and that means pick up your feet <laughs> and but we'll be talking, you know, but she's doing her therapy at the same time as talking to me. And uh, so when I'm talking about the creativity course, she's saying, well, you know, it sounds like that's kind of a therapy in itself. Uh, I go, well, yeah, I guess so. Because uh, uh, I do remember when I started the physical therapy, I asked about what were the results that I was going to see. Um, and I was told that it really depends on me. What were the results that I expected and what were the results that I was willing to work for? Um, and we really, she's been interested, uh, about what I, about this and, uh, and how I react to everything. And, you know, and she'll, she's the one that'll, will kind of, uh, tie things together, you know, cause she'll, We'll talk about uh, that we know that we should exercise, um, but uh, a lot of us put it off, me especially. Um, but, um, you know, you need to be ready for the flu season. You need to be ready for uh, accidents. You you heal better if you're taking care of yourself. Uh, there are things that uh, you just can't plan for, um, pretty much like in investing. Um, you know, we know that we should be, uh, saving more, that there's going to be, we need a cash reserve for car and home repairs, uh, things that are common sense things should be common sense, but we just neglect them. Um, so it, it was interesting to see the relationship. Um, you know, I guess I had to look at Ken as being a, a, a financial therapist. And, uh, so that, that was interesting to, to, to see that. So also in this lesson, I really liked listening to Ken talk about the zero state and the ready room. Um, personally, I think I enter my ready room twice a day. Um, and at the beginning, it's kind of an aggressive state. You know, I want to say that I'm in control of my life and I'm taking charge of what's going to happen today. And I'm readying to do battle. I build my confidence. And I know I'm going to leave that room prepared. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm going to return with a little bit of a different attitude. You know, I've, I've completed uh, whatever the day had. And, and that uh, so I want to be open minded. I'm more subdued. I'm probably going to get a little bit religious here. But uh, so. I view that as my time to question myself. Um, I want to recognize that I'm very blessed and that the gains that I received were from the help of others. And uh, it's at that time that I'm going to seek forgiveness for the sins that I committed. Um, 
And then I need to determine how I'm going to express the gratitude for the gifts that I have been given. Um, and it's also at that time that I'm probably going to consider my role and purpose in life. Um, and for me, both times that I'm in the ready room, it's a very private thing that I'm going to be open and really honest with myself. Um, and then also at that, uh, at the end of the day, I'm going to recognize that I am a very small part of a big and beautiful universe. So I really, I like the zero state. I really like the, the ready room. Uh, and I really do see the value of that. So great lesson. Aho. Good. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Sorry, I guy. I came late. I don't know if Chen Long has already gone in. We're well into it already, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Um yeah, so um I I like that. Um uh, sorry, I mean I'm, I'm just I just came late, I'm not very prepared, but um I, I really like that lesson that Ken posted. So I actually worked on worked on that and and I I I started yesterday and I was gonna work at it this morning. Um, but then something came up this morning and uh, and, and I couldn't. But I think it looks uh, you know, it's to me and maybe it's it's like a Rorschach uh, ink blot test. And whatever you tell people that you see is actually a reflection of, of of yourself rather than what is actually there. So so here goes. Uh, <laughs> So here goes my my take on it. So um, I, it's not here, is it? Uh, uh, Ken, the the flashcard. But do, do you know what I'm talking about, uh, all of you? When um, it, it's I, I, well, anyway, Ken, if you've got it, you can share it. But uh, it's the one that Ken posted ye uh, yesterday. I think he woke up and he had a dream and you know inspiration and bam, you know, there's another good, good, good post. Um, so what what I see. Um, is really um maybe i can share my screen then then and maybe you guys can can see what what i'm talking about it's a real mess at the moment let me see uh, okay go with that can you guys see that it's got probably bits of you can you can see that right yeah uh, can you see anything yeah, we can see. It. Okay, cool. Yeah, sure. Good, so, the, so, so this is this is this is a picture. So I can point to it. I guess what what I see is you know in in this point is is where I say signal generators is is really like a like a, a, a Z three pinch or some something quiet and then things are ready to go. We've come to this state where where we are in this in this kind of blue box here. And this this blue line to me is is um, the the end of that session uh, trading session and and trading session is about to to start this way that, that's what I see um, so we are in this compound critical state down here and and we're ready to either go up or go down or maybe drift drift sideways and the 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 little circles the smaller ones so there are two two time frames in here um like the nightly podcast one one is like a swing time frame and one is uh, the intraday so the the, the smaller circles on are, are the intraday uh kind of risk box i think this black one would to me be the intraday risk box and the uh the bigger circles represent a risk or an r of the swing time frame 
that, that's what I see. Maybe that that is the risk box over there for that. I I don't know. Um, and that that's how I I kind of read these things. And let me just see. Look at the questions. Uh, which way would you trade? Uh, uh, either way, really. I mean, depending on 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 how it goes. Um, and where would it would fail again? You know, it depends on 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 this. It might go okay. So so the 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 green lines, the levels, and the red lines. I read them as as support and resistance uh, uh, lines. Uh, so if it's at the top, it's you know would be resistance, and it's a bottom, it's it's kind of support. So you a move can go. Let's say on just for ease, I'll use the bigger bigger time frame. It can go there. It can move up there, and it might get near to one of these. And at that point, you know, it's it, at this level, it could either hit that level and come back down where where it wouldn't go up anymore, um, or it could go past that level. And you know, usually that's the point if you're doing multiple positions, so you can put in the second position and see it go. Um, where it would fail, I would say, is if it probably, uh, if you, uh, I can't see, but if you take this small intraday thing and there's a black risk box, if you start the day, then you're going long, but it, it comes down under that risk box, then it, it would it would fail. Um, would you stop and reverse? I think that's one of the, the things that I don't do very well and I do, don't do very often, so that's a, a challenge uh, for me, and I don't have an answer to that at the minute um on on i think i've answered some of this on a win where would it stall i guess if you're long and, and it hits either any of these uh lines uh where would you preserve uh i think again at, at some of these these lines and it starts moving back so oh, okay if if this thing here i think is what ken would call the the tactical space if it goes up if you're long and you're waiting for it to go up to hit this line when it kind of hits this line, you probably want to get your stop to no lose plus dinner for two. And and then you see what, what happens with that. And if it starts coming back, my problem would be, which is like I have this fog be right, fear of giving back. If it hits one R and it starts pulling back to like say 0.5 R, I would probably want to take profits. Um, even though let's say it's still above the the dragon and i think that is my my big issue to to work with is really to let let the trade run but but at the minute that's how i probably would would do it um then it's not not you know it, it, it has cost me at, at times because you you take 0.5 on it starts rerunning up here and then i, I kind of want to oh it's gone past this line let's go get in there and of course it fails again <laughs> You know what do you do, and, and you end up with the either scratch the whole trade, or or a little bit of loss. Um, I I didn't get to where would you re-enter, but I think that that's where I am. So that's on this thing, and I'm just gonna unshare it for now. How do I do that? Uh huh. Um. Okay. Stop share. All right, have fun shared. Yeah, and then I worked through some of the, some of the questions in there. Um, let me just try and see where. And flashcards are a mechanics tool instructions. And what does your toolkit look like? Actually, the problem is I don't I don't have a lot of flashcards. Maybe that is my problem. I mean, I I do have like the standard patterns that I, I I've learned and like SSC and and the collapsing dragon, and I have those things. And the thing for me is that I I find it a bit hard to use the the flashcards. For example, the SSC when I was studying it, I said okay that that that's understandable. It makes a lot of sense. Um, but in the real life, when when you start trading, it's a bit messier than that. It, it never turns out exactly the 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 way that you know uh, that looks like. So, and then I think that maybe ties into one of the lessons of the week, uh, which is my aha. I think it is in one of the nightly podcasts, and yeah, it's a lesson that says. You know, I think it says don't over plan, but learn to make better decisions. 
you know so that that is the 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 key thing for me you know like i i i tend to i always had this idea that if you plan and plan and, and get it all there you know i can trade better but actually it it i don't because when things as i say things are, are normally a bit messier than in real life uh, i mean when the, when when in the real trading session and the, and the, how it works and everything and so what i want to do is is actually learn to make better decisions at those points rather than say you know and then freeze and say oh wow it's not in my plan what what am i going to do so that's my aha for for the week and um and i guess i have a question but um uh, so i'll just, i'll just share it cuz uh, uh, like in in the swing swing uh, swing trades and and that you've been doing can and and the intraday cuz i see i wonder if you enter the the trade as a swing or or you or you start it as an intraday and i guess my problem would be if i started it as an intraday and i get you know stopped out or exited um, then how do i uh, change it back to a swing again or do you enter two different trades at one time i suppose that's that's my thinking thinking uh, uh this week uh, that's it um uh, zero state you know last time i came here uh, um last time i came here my team got beaten 7-0 <laughs> big big splashing uh, uh, on record and all that kind of stuff and you know it it i mean it's great that i i actually was managed to the distance myself and reset pretty quickly um which i guess it's 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 uh, you know it's um kind of tribute to to what we've been doing here in creativity and and on on this trading journey really i mean in the zero state we keep talking about it and uh now so yeah just wanted to share that and that's it for this week i hope yeah Hi, good morning again. Good afternoon, Queen. Um, normally, I I am a little bit excited excited when I doing the C two O two courses lessons, but today um, somehow I'm at the lower end of my mood. I just don't want to uh, hold too much. <laughs> Anyway, that's my current situation. I'll do it uh, anyway. So my my word of last week is a mission. You know, when we talk about mission statement, that's a really elegant, meaningful, philosophical statement. Um, it's always hard for me to write a mission statement. Uh, so last week, I think about that. I think I have to be realistic, have to be practical. Uh, first, uh, you know, uh, I think about uh, my uh, personal goals in remaining of this life. Then my desired result for myself, for my family, maybe later to, you know, to the um, deeper uh, sense of meaning what is my desired result for the society and the humanity? Humanity. Oh, still tr struggle with the mission, but uh, my direction is to be personal and uh, practical, realistic. Uh, what I thought last week about mission. So, my work in progress for the last two weeks, I try to assess. My collapsing dragon uh, challenge. So I take a collapsing dragon pattern only. I use the Forex uh, uh, test five to do that. I, I think it's the most difficult process 
from the plan, prepare, execute, assessment. So the assessment is the most difficult to do. You know, I don't know what to do because the personal, the somebody else assessment maybe not what I needed. Also a situational. You know, the any single trade is different. You know, when I take it, when I exit. So it take me uh, two weeks to do that. Um, I read a lot, uh, including what uh, can post on the Patreon. Anyway, I, I did it. Uh, you know, what I found out is that my thoughts and feelings really dominate the result of the tweets. But it's difficult to take notes of all the feelings, all the thoughts. So that's why I think it's difficult to assess the result. Uh, if I look at the numbers, the numbers is, is not bad. Whatever I did, uh, you know, let's take uh, any 50 trees or any 20 trees, the results always positive. The win, the win rate is high. Uh, normally 60%. Uh, you know, I always get positive R. That's the good, good thing. But all, but other than that, if I look the single trade, I make a lot of uh, mistakes. Uh, the number one mistake is I, I move the initial stop too quick. It's because I, I'm willing to take a loss. When I prepare to take a loss, my thinking is, okay, if I enter earlier, I could get a larger R. I don't think of the loss. Whenever my uh, entry hit, my mind instantly leaps to the worry side. I just uh, don't want to take a loss. So that's why I move my initial stop very quick. Whenever I can, whenever I see a chance, it's like, uh, you know, I take the short position, the price move down, I move my uh, stop a little bit. So the result is I take uh, many small profits, but I kill the good trade. You know, look at my trade, I don't get a big larger R. So that's my number one mistake. Kill the good trade. I'm willing to take a loss. So my uh, second mistake is mind freeze. I just watch the price move. I don't know what to do. Or I, I'm, uh, I'm willing to do anything. So that's uh, my next mistake. Sorry. Uh, the other mistake is the out of balance. I have bad trade. I take another trade. I end up with the next loss. Then continue. Um, until I realize, okay, I shouldn't trade. Then I realize, you know, the mental state is really important. Uh, that's how important the zero state is. So I try to add a, another question to the standard frame questions. So am I in the, in the zero state? I, tr I try to do that, but not always. Sometimes I just forget, just trade, take trade. So when I take trade, my uh, vision gets narrower. Only focus on the uh, price action, maybe one bar, two bar. Uh, forget to the perspective of the day, day low, or day high, or other significant uh, prices. Uh, that's what I found out. Still need to do the assessment. Uh, but uh, on the plus side, positive side, my trading getting better. Uh, I still have a uh, confidence in this method. Um, 
last week I tried to uh, listen to um, Mark Douglas uh, webinars. Uh, there's uh, recordings free from the internet, YouTube. Uh, that's because I read uh, Mark Dawson. Uh, that gentleman uh, shared the uh, presentation from that. I get a lot of ideas how to do the, my uh, assessment, including deploy my other strategies. Uh, it's not a bad week, just feeling bad about all those mistakes. Uh, what I did. Uh, yeah, that's uh, combined today's lessons and what I did the last weeks. So next week I'll pause for a week, uh, do my uh, family income tax return. I always do that by myself. It's, it's uh, a little bit simpler because the income is not difficult. But one thing is good in Canada, we don't have the different for tax, different between short term trade, uh, intraday trade versus the long term holding. We don't have that. You capital gain is the capital gain. No matter you do the intraday trading or you hold for three years, 10 years. That's a make the tax return very simple and make my trading simple. It doesn't matter. I, close my trading today, intraday, or for 10 years. Uh, that's my plan for next week. Pro probably I'll still do some simulation, even reset up my, uh, um, my trading platform to some paper trading. You know, I truly understand uh, less planning, just educate the, that. I did that. I, I, I tend to over trade, believe me. I, I, I tend to take a lot of trades. That's how and what my losses are. So this time I decide to take my time to do the simulation uh, and then gradually progress to paper trade and then to real money. Oh, that's my plan. Hopefully I can get over, you know, the Qatar challenge to the paper trade. It's not, I don't know the pattern. It's my uh, mind flip from, you know, make a big R to, oh, I don't want to make a loss. That's the key issue. I think the resolution will be control my mental states, you know, I still try to figure out what my zero state like, you know, how to use the anchor to get back to the zero state, or even you know, just stop trading, get away from the computer. Uh, that's my, uh, my take in this lessons and uh, plan for next week, I hope. Well, this, uh, I came, I listened to all your stories and uh, you just shot my plans to pieces. So this feels just like a trade, like watching the opening price bar because I had it all planned out what I was going to say today and what I thought the truth that I needed to share was. And then I heard Ernie, let me just look at my notes because I'm totally off script now, but Ernie said, uh, what are the results that I expect? And then he asked the question, what are the results that I'm willing to work for? 
And he commented that we know what we should be doing, but sometimes we don't do them, right? Everybody in life. And then I hear Chen Long talking about his energy level being a little bit low and he thinks maybe he's over trading. And I heard Kuhn's questions and, and truth. So that inspired me just to tell a story that I really never planned to share. So I'm going to just start with some lesson notes and I'll hopefully work up to executing the story that wants to be told. On lesson four, win this battle and not the last. Um, <clears throat> interesting that even the greatest people at what they do, Hannibal was probably at, at one point considered the greatest general in the world, and he fell because of his inability to see reality. His What he saw was not actually reality. It came to pass quickly that he was defeated, but I don't think he saw that coming. I tried to avoid, uh, so it says pick, exercise one says pick a historical war and and uh, study the first battle and the last. And I just have to admit that World War II aviation is kind of something that I've been involved in my whole life. So old World War II airplanes are still flying today. We have some, we fly them. And um, <clears throat> there's a lot of museums we support. We do a lot of um um, funeral flyovers for World War II veterans. When they pass away, we fly the airplanes to their services and honor them that way. So I could speak for hours on that, but I I won't do that at this time. Um, let's see. One thing I learned in my research, though, was something I didn't know. <clears throat> Apparently, the first battle of World War II was um, the Germans and the Polish at Westerplatte, where the Germans attacked uh, uh, a Polish army garrison there with battleships and kinetic weapons. So the battleship was the, the big um, force multiplier at that time. And the Polish did a very admirable job of, of holding them back for six days, I believe. And then obviously, if you go to the end of World War II, um, the atomic bomb was dropped. And then the second bomb was dropped and that was the end. So there was really no response at that time to that weapon, right? So that was the end. From my perspective, um, just one quick footnote of a, a long story that I could tell is, you know, <clears throat> I think the takeaway for this lesson for me was creativity creates creativity. So when somebody creates something so new and so innovative that it overpowers everything that you know, you're forced to get creative or perish or become irrelevant or whatever. Innovation demands better innovation, right? So it becomes this race of who's going to create, who's going to be the most creative and the fastest and best innovator to remain in their current position or to rise to the top or to fall to the bottom. So that was a big aha moment. <clears throat> but it also reminded me too, um, at the beginning of the war, we weren't even in it. It was a European war. And the Germans were innovating and creating new technologies and deploying them very rapidly. And in the air power war, which became a critical aspect um, in World War II, they were so fast at it that it inspired us or it, it didn't inspire us it just demanded that we respond in a creative innovative manner so at the beginning of world war ii the best aircraft we had was a p-40 warhawk which was the first monoplane fighter before that it was biplane type you know two-wing airplanes very by today's standards very um lackluster in their performance but the P-51 Mustang was kind of the aircraft that came out of World War II. And it was a response to the German air superiority that they enjoyed for a while. The interesting thing is the prototype rolled out in September of 1940, 102 days after the order had been placed for it. They said, we need a really good fighter plane. It doesn't exist. Someone has to pick, has to create this. So they did that in 102 days. It flew on the 26th of October, 1940, 149 days from the day that they decided they would spend money to
to create it. <clears throat> An uncommonly short period of time. In this day and age, we can't even design a tire in 149 days. We can't get a bolt approved for use. An existing bolt that we know the specifications for, we can't get that bolt approved for installation in 149 days. So it makes me wonder if we're really as creative in some areas as we should be. Maybe we should go back to things that actually worked. Maybe we've gotten too far off the path. Good intentions have led to um, just things that aren't working. This, the zero state exercise um, was something that I've been working on for the last couple of weeks. I'm going to just kind of it, it gave me the image that Ken uh, <clears throat> probably had in mind, which is of a gladiator or a warrior preparing for battle. But it also, ironically enough, the opening lines of the story created an image of modern day of me just coming home at the end of the day and you metaphorically shed your armor, you know, which is the protective shield you have against the outside world and all the things you face out there. Once you get in your own home, you relax and you refresh because you're in your own safe, comfortable space and you do your preparation for the next day of, of literally or figuratively doing battle when you go out and navigate the world and all the things you have to do out there. And that's just kind of a, a daily cycle in our lives. I kind of drew that parallel. And obviously it can all be applied to trading. Um, I'm going to skip a lot of this and just go to the story that uh, wants to be told. So I've been doing, I told you guys, um, I think on February 23rd, <clears throat> I started trading. Uh, I took 30 over a course of a week. I took 30 trades on the three minute chart in my best attempt to um, emulate or, or mimic the sniper trading techniques. And um, <clears throat> it didn't feel good. It felt, uh, I didn't feel good enough because I'm comparing myself to Ken and the charts he posts every night. So I didn't think mine were good enough, but actually 30 trades, the best I could do on a three minute chart produced results that I was proud of, you know, and it showed me that I could actually do it, but it never felt right. It never felt good enough when I was doing it, but I also felt like I was over trading. I took 30 trades in a week's time, which felt like way too many to me because I'm not used to trading on these small time frames. And that evolved into this one minute challenge that I gave myself. Um, I described a couple of weeks ago and Ken said, you know, it's, it's like getting in the ring with Mike Tyson. You get in there and you do your best and then you go rest for a while. Well, I kind of pushed that to the extreme because, and that's kind of why I didn't want to tell the story because I figured, you know, in my mind, my process is, is flawed and it's not the way it should be done. You know, I know how to build a house, but it's not the way any other, anybody else would build a house. So I just push that to the extreme. I've taken about 150 trades on the one minute chart, usually trading two at a time and in the and recently trading four one minute charts at a time. And the idea is find out where all the limits are, my limits. There's no limits to the system. The system is the system. The market is the market, but it was the idea of the maximum sustainable rate of learning and just pushing it, learning as much as I could in a week's time or two. It's been two weeks actually doing this. And uh, also the fact that I can't sit and trade all day long on one chart. So if I have two or three hours to trade, I want to get the most out of it. And there's no risk. That's the thing. Um, I am trading real money because if I don't, I just won't take it serious. It looks like a video game right on the screen. But um, here's just some takeaways that I'll share. I didn't plan on it, but my fear of a, of a one hour loss was totally real on a one minute chart with 11 cents of risk with an insignificant position size. It still felt, I still felt fear like I don't want to take a one hour loss. But actually, the system is designed to take that loss, right? That's exactly what we plan to do. So doing that, there's no shame in that. That's an honorable thing. Take your loss because that trade didn't work. Um, 
the price action in the in the one minute chart freaked me out in the beginning, and then it was very difficult. And and then you adjust to it, and you realize that that vertical movement is the same on every chart. It's just the scaling and the the appearance that it gives when compared to the bars before it, right? So the moving three cents on a three minute chart or a one minute chart is still a three cent move or a thirty cent move. So there's no difference there. I found it helpful to zoom out, not to zoom in on the last 15 bars, to zoom out and get a little bigger perspective, especially when you're trading more than one. Um, I also found it, I ended up muting the price bars to a light gray color so I could still see them, but just barely, which made me focus on the RL10 and the Dragon and the PSR and not be drawn to the price, which helped a lot. Um, I actually took this thing to the point four charts at a time um, is unsustainable for me. Fatigue sets in fairly quickly. You can do it. I can do it pretty well for maybe 30 to 60 minutes. And then it just all falls apart. And I do all the things that everyone else does. It's a human trait. Um, my greatest failures occurred not in, it's not that I can't see the patterns and I don't know where to enter or exit or I don't have a plan because trading those one minute charts forces you to make all those decisions in advance because you can't think about it in the moment. And I have a note here that says, I can't think when I'm trading. I can think before I start trading and I can think after I'm finished, but I cannot think properly when I'm in the trade. So that kind of highlighted all of Ken's teachings. He doesn't teach us to think about the trade when we're in it. He teaches us to think about it before we do it so that in that moment, we know where the stop is supposed to be and the stop's where it is. And, and another thing I discovered is no matter where you put it, it'll get hit. So if you have your stop close, like a sniper exit, that's where you're going to get out. If you have it way back and you're hoping for a massive three-legged move up, you're probably going to get hit there as well, whether that's a loss or a no-lose plus dinner for two. So one of my other notes is put your stop where it needs to be, where you'll be happy getting out because it's probably going to get hit no matter where it's at. So trying to, the exits are extremely difficult. Um, there's no per, you can't, I have a note here that says I, I can never be right. You know, I can make money, but I can never be right because nothing feels right. You, when you, when you do your after action review, you tend to be critical and say, oh, look what you did here. You should have had that stop further back and you would have caught the whole move. Or the opposite is true on the next chart you look at. You say, oh, you should have had it closer because you gave back too much. So that's a very elusive thing trying to be right. I also tried to separate um, the learning, trading for, for learning versus trading for profit. And I think I was successful in a way and two weeks ago, I had this huge internal conflict, emotional heart, like um, emotional conflict of I shouldn't be wasting my time doing this. I should be trading for money. And then I res it resolved itself. And this past week, um, there was I was calm the entire time, no emotion at all to speak of. But the conflict still existed in my head. So like it moved up into my head. So I have this intellectual debate going on that, you know, do what you want to do. And when you get tired of doing that, then we'll go do something important. But it's not a, it wasn't a emotional conflict. So I thought that was interesting. And now I think of the one minute chart, kind of like the flight simulators that I train in. Um, it's a good thing to do every now and then to go push yourself to the limit and go learn these things and reinforce. What it does is it shows you what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. And we tend to focus on the things we're doing wrong. And we don't give ourselves credit for what we're doing right. But my big breakdown um, was worth everything because it was it was with order entry on my platform. So I think in the beginning I was afraid of wrecking my histogram because I had this beautiful histogram and all my stats looked great. Well, I've wrecked that because I have so many trades that are at zero or 0 0.2 wins or one R losses that that's all wrecked. So th I can just get over that, right? Not worry about that and just keep on trading. But also, I realized that I'm going to be learning for every trade for as long as I trade. So if they don't have to be mutually exclusive. It's not like you only learn when you're trying to learn and you only make money when you're trying to make money. Because for my whole life, I've been learning and trying to make money at the same time. So I think 
those two things don't have to be separated and they probably shouldn't because we never quit learning. Even when we master some of the techniques, we have to continue to keep our data. This is coming from someone who never kept data before for whatever reason, I was too lazy. I was afraid to see what my performance actually was, whatever it was. I'm now addicted to the data and uh, the data. So, so I gave myself free reign for two weeks to do whatever, you know, to, to do whatever I wanted to do on these one minute charts. But one of the rules was you have to keep the data. So I have the trade log data for every trade I took. I have the journal entries for every day. And I did that. And when you're taking 20 or 30 trades a day, that's a lot of work to get all that stuff put in there. So that in and of itself is a reason for me to trade less because it's less work at the end of the day. And the idea of over trading, I don't think 30 trades a week is over trading actually on a small time frame, especially if you're trading more than one symbol. That seems to be a very reasonable thing to do. Now, taking 30 trades a day on a one minute chart, I, for me, feels way too many. And my results bear that out. The fewer trades, the better the results of those trades. Um, so I think I've got this. I think this is a Larry Williams quote from about 35 years ago. But on the one minute chart, it seems like fear keeps me from doing the thing that I should do. And I just did it anyway. So I realized also, and then greed makes you do, makes me do the things that I shouldn't do, right? Those, if that, that kind of emerged from that experience, but um, I lost my train of thought here. During the course of that, I kind of explored my zero state like a room. So I don't know exactly where it is, but I know it. Oh, here was my train of thought. In the beginning on those first 30 trades where I did well, I was just using my sheer willpower to overcome my emotions because I knew the rules and I was determined to follow them and none of it felt right, but it was just willpower. The problem with that is it doesn't feel good when you're doing it. And if I don't ultimately learn to enjoy this, I don't think that I'll continue it. So I was looking at other states that I could be in and still trade well. And, the, and so I kind of explored my zero state as if it were a room and I found out where the walls were and I found one way to trade that feels so great, you know, just relaxed, calm, not attached to the results. The state that I feel like that I want to be in when I trade produces the worst results for me because I'm too detached to actually remain engaged. I get bored and then the boredom leads to you taking trades that you shouldn't take because you have this little voice saying, let's take a trade, I'm bored. So that's not my space. Um, the test pilot willful space is not it either. It produces really good results, but it just drains me of energy and I can't sustain it. But I think ultimately it's gonna be something like a hunter's mindset where you go out into the woods and you have a mission, but you're willing to wait patiently until it's time to act. Um, so it's not too relaxed because my, my results show that that's not good. And I hear my story and all of your stories. So I, I don't know if any of this makes any sense to you guys, but it just felt like this is what I needed to say today. Um, and the last thing is I finally, the reason I kind of came back to Tortoise Capital is to develop the, the ability to stop and reverse and to trade the short side of the market. So I have traded the short side of the market for a long time in a fearful and unfocused way i would have a plan and then i would take profits too soon because they happen so much quicker on the downside than the upside that i wouldn't hold on to those trades the way i should that was one of my reasons for doing this in the first place but i finally had the courage a couple of weeks ago to um take some overnight risk on these within this frame this tortoise framework i have another account that trades separately so I had two positions that I elected to hold short overnight and I felt really good about it. And I thought I'd done my homework and everything was great. And then I watched the nightly podcast and Ken puts his bullish case out for both of my positions. And he's holding those two positions long. 
And I immediately felt fear, like, you know, doubt, uncertainty, like I got the whole thing wrong. And ultimately, I think it probably worked out for both of us. I exited the positions on the open with the profit. And I think uh, in his longer time frame swing, he was in the middle of a of a multi-day swing and, and his trades probably paid too. So we you can both get paid. It depends on your time frame and your plan. But I, ultimately the market doesn't care what I've planned. It doesn't care. This is just out of my journal on one of my low moments when I was thinking, you know, that I can do better. It says the market doesn't care what I've planned. I don't, it doesn't care that I've studied. It'll tell that story for its for the day in its own time and in its own way. And my job is to carefully observe and accept the story of the market for what it is as a trader. Because we try to guess what it's gonna do. I try to guess what it's gonna do next. I try to plan for what I'm gonna do when it does X, Y, or Z. And then it does something totally different. So my best trading is actually just um, watching. I can, observe, I can observe it and describe it, but I have no ability to predict it. And that's highlighted when you trade a one minute chart for a long time. So, yeah, I think that's it. I th and I also had the, the um, listen to you guys, I had an epiphany this week that I'm much nicer than student for the past uh, two weeks, he went home. And I realized I'm much nicer to him than I am to myself. So he was, he was in my trader seat, so to speak, when he was doing this aviation training. And he was down on himself and, and his, he, was, he felt like he wasn't good enough. And I was the encouraging coach saying, look, we all start at zero. And I was constantly encouraging him, but I realized I don't do that to myself too much. So I think it's important that we have balance in our assessment and maybe just begin by finding out all the things that we do right or that I do right before I start putting on that critical hat and uh, beating myself up for the things that I wish I'd done better. So, I hope. Once again, you guys just remind me that the only stories that matter are the ones you live. Because <laughs> uh, you can hear an expert tell you these things all day. It doesn't matter. But you got to hear yourself saying them. Uh, it's just amazing work today. Um, so my, my work in progress, my... My response to the price action that I just heard. So, uh, you know, Ernie, I, Ernie I, I want you to think about um, excavating an open pit mine and spiral path up a mountain. You just keep excavating, right? It's almost like if when you put those two things together, here's a moment of Zen. You got to be very careful about how you just progressively excavate that mine. You got to go to the next spot and dig when you're ready. You can only go to where you're ready to dig. So you got to dig. And you look over there, there's somebody else going way, way deep in their mine. And you think, man, I should be going deep. Yeah, but you can't go deep in the mine until you get there. So just do the things you got to do to get there. So you start excavating that mine, unpacking carefully because you got to watch out for you know, the collapsing walls and that. Um, where are you going to put the dirt? Well, you're building the mountain. You guys are all building the mountain that you are climbing. It, the mountain is in your head. The mountain is in your work. So as you pull that stuff out of your depths and you just pile it somewhere, put that into intentionally, don't get rid of the dirt, build the wall, the dike, the dam, the fire break, the perimeter, uh, the the uh, 
topsoil that you're going to use to grow crops or you're actually building a mountain that's going to allow you to climb up so you can see far with wisdom and you're going to climb that mountain in little spirals it's a deliberate process it's like or, or a pyramid same thing so connect those two and just say where wherever i am is where i'm doing the work and there's wherever you are there's work to be done and when you feel like you need to be doing a particular kind of work, go to the place where that work gets done. And you've got all of those places in your ecosystem of trading to do, right? And you got to visit all of those things. You got to go pull the weeds. You got to go plow the field. You got to let that field lie fallow. You got to feed the hogs, as Norm McDonald would say. Uh, for Kun. And all of you, I, I would try this if you want. Take this script on the zero state in the lesson and just record it in your own voice until you're satisfied that you got the flavor of it right or pieces of the script. And then once you have that and it's good enough for you and you know exactly what I mean by that, or you should listen to that every day for a week before you trade and at the end of the session when you give gratitude and forgiveness listen to that thing and say did I do that thing so bookshelf the trading activity with that intentional statement about the zero state and don't judge it or anything just just listen to it and then let it go and see what that does for you after a week or two weeks, probably two weeks. But I'd start with a week. But you got to do the work of recording it in your own voice and get over your fussiness. Oh, that wasn't good. Okay, keep going until it's good enough. Just You already know what it's got to sound like to be good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just doesn't have to be embarrassing. And you're the only one listening to it anyway. So what part of you is going to be embarrassed at listening to your own voice? That's the voice you'd be talking to. Because I'll tell you what. Let's put, let's put a little spotlight on the voice that's giving us all our inner critiques. Hey, you're, you're so good at pointing out all my flaws and the things that I'm trying to do and I'm trying to learn. Let's record your self-talk and play that out in public and see how well that stands up. That's what the essence of the owl meditation is, by the way. You just record all the, record all of it. Every piece and enjoy every piece of negative self-talk and self-despisement, all of that stuff. Just write out the words and just feel who you are. And then on the other side of it, just record all the emotions that you feel when you hear yourself that critical. Just put one word emotions on that. Put that on two sides of a five by eight card. Put that card in an envelope when you're done with all that self-loathing. Just put it, light it on fire and watch the smoke and just and sit there until there's the next thing to do. So that's one way, self-talk. Now I want you to record, just try this thought experiment. Record that speech on the zero state in your own voice. When you're satisfied with it, then listen to it before and after each session for a week and just see what that intention does for you. It'll just, you'll just get over all the, the all the bullshit of the self-talk get past that or what's the value to you of dwelling in that place oh well I don't have to actually go do hard work because I can just beat myself up a little bit and just enjoy the pain and suffering and stay in that let you get out of there uh, the voice of the zero state in that speech is your home crowd you're going out on the field and that crowd is there and it makes a difference 
the, you listen to every athlete at the professional level where every mistake they make is magnified forever on YouTube. Look at this when he got hit in the head with the ball. The home team loves you and wants you to win, and they're cheering for you no matter what. They want to see you competing. That's all. All a, a genuine fan wants is I want to see my team fighting for us, for the boys, for the city. So record that Zero State speech with that in mind. Next. That little... Uh, flashcard that vertical blue line is the pulse of time it's like an EKG that thing is just pushing every guy with the plan and money and worry and fear is just get that wall of reality is just pushing them into the next bar and they're stumbling around just like everybody else now uh, does your plan account for how everybody who's also in the market is making decisions based on their fear and greed? Is that how good your plan is? Does that how good your plan has to be before you can trade? Or just know that there's a million, a billion other traders out there stumbling around making fear and greed decisions. And I love Jeff's quote, fear keeps me from doing what I should. Greed makes me do what I shouldn't. So who else do you think has that challenge? everybody else in the market. They just don't know it or what to do about it. That's why they stay in that space. So that big vertical blue line of the current moment, the mindful moment, is where you are. So that was a perfect description of that, uh, of that template and then fused with the standard framing questions to interpret it. Dude, that's the best five minutes on the internet. Uh, losing a soccer match 7-0 to zero is still, it's just a one-hour loss. Ten Hagen knows that. He already knows going into every game what it's going to feel like when they lose as the manager of Man United. But he, you know how bad that feels with Sir Alec walk, watching you at Old Trafford? He's getting paid to take that loss so that other people don't have to own it. That's what he does. That's what the manager does. So he's willing to take it. He says, I, I'm not afraid. to. I've lost soccer games before. A 7 to nil loss is a one-hour loss. So what are you going to do about it is the only thing that actually matters. So that's what he did. He said, all right, well. We've come a long way, but we can still get beat 7-0 to nil by a team that's having a tough season, too. So what are we going to do about it? Let's go to work. Let's go. So 7-0, seven, seven to nil, it's a one-hour loss. Uh, I want you to think about, relative to your question, um, there is a room in which you do intraday trading, and there is a room in which you do swing trading. And on that wall, there's flashcards and art and hanging. And there is a door warden who's going to interrogate you every time you propose to go between the two rooms. What's the password? You know, why, three-minute trader, do you think you should go into the other room with that trade? Hey, 30-minute trader, why do you think you need to go into the three-minute trade with that trade? Just answer that question to that interrogator. And he's got, it's like crossing the border. Every time, you know, they're going to look, uh, let me see your papers. And then you're sitting on the rest area when you're out of the trade, and you're, am I going to go to the three-minute or to the 30-minute? You still got to, Cross the border, so have your papers in order and know why you're going in between. Think of that model. So developing the coaching eye, why that's so hard but so important. It, I hope it's hard because that means that nobody else will do it. 
or enough people are not going to do it that we have an edge if we do it. So I hope it's hard. It's hard. Take a look at that soccer training video I posted on Patreon, 13 minutes of um, giving advice to my coaches on how to look at the game. Maybe 10% or 5% of the comments were about what the kid with the ball was doing. Everything else was about where should the rest of the team be positioned. Uh, because there's 22 people, there's 23 people on the field, one of them at most has the ball. So the team that plays better without the ball is the team that always wins, minus the rounding error, the messy effect. Uh, so about 90% of the comments I put in there were about how to look at the game without the ball. And then a few cases, I, I actually had to go back and put a few more in there to praise the kids with the ball so that they could see that it, you know they're part of the game too. But developing the coaching eye for yourself is even harder than coaching others because you are simultaneously in the fishbowl and outside of the fishbowl, but never at the same time. So that's that makes it a little easier. Uh, so yeah, you got to figure out how to feel the feelings that you were in, or you just say, look, it actually doesn't matter what the feelings were because that's going to be so variable. I actually don't have to worry about it. As long as I have a standard way to manage the emotions that I feel, if I always just do the same thing, then it's not hard tracking all the feelings because you will have disassociated feelings with actions. So rather than do all that hard work, of trying to catalog all the feelings and then associate certain feelings with it. Fuck it, leave all that alone. Drop it like a wing tank. Use the energy of the emotions like a wing tank for a P-47 in World War II so that they could escort the bombers over Berlin before the P-51 came in. And when you go into the fight, you don't need the emotions. You drop the wing tanks, but you got a full load of fuel on and now you're ready to fight. I'll take a P-47 all day. That aircraft had zero wing malfunctions in the entire war and outperformed at altitude and was the combat infantryman's best friend. The Jug. I'll take a P-47 all day. Love the P-51, beautiful aircraft. Give me a P-47, and we're going to win. Uh, I'm going to send you the link to Greg's Automobiles and Airplanes, where he does the tech analysis of all, I mean every, World War II aircraft. He's a pilot. You'll enjoy that one, Greg. All the data that you want. Uh, so developing the coaching eye, part of that confidence that comes when you're good at it is you now know, hey, I'm actually free to just trade the way I'm going to trade because my coaching eye is recording everything and I'll think about it when it's time to think about it. So you can just move that body of work to later because you're recording everything on the flight recorder. And now all I got to do is fly the airplane, make the trade, dig the hole. So developing the trusted coach's eye for yourself means that you can stop worrying about thinking about what the answer to the question in your head is. Well, what if I did, what should I do? No, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff because you're going to think about that not under pressure of the trade, but that's what assessment means. That's what the assessment means is that you've moved that to the time when you're supposed to do that, which is when you're not executing. That's when you're assessing. Don't cross the wires. Uh, I wish everybody had Chun Lung's problem. My job as a teacher and a coach is to try to give everybody Chun Lung's problems. Here's Chun Lung's problems. Man, I've got this system that gives me a lot of trades, 
reliably with a single pattern that has a very good winning rate and every 20 trades, no matter what, is positive. But it feels hard. Yeah. Yeah, it's supposed to. Uh, and it never feels right when I'm in it. Yeah, so? Now you know you're in the right spot. How many traders want to be able to say that? Uh, all of them. So quit whining about it and realize that the what think about the connection between an acorn and an oak tree. The market is giving you acorn after acorn of small reliable Rs. And then all you can see is the oak tree that you can't carry back to your little squirrel hut. Yeah, but it's giving you acorns. Go plant those acorns in another field so that you can grow all the oak trees you want to generate more acorns in the future. But you got to go get the acorns. The only issue really now is when you have that reliable system to generate R, don't change any of that architecture. None of, don't change any of the framing or the geometry. The variable you change is the dollars at risk per trade. If I could get a quarter of an R on every trade with a 60% win rate, I'll trade it 10 times a day for two and a half R. How, how much does that R have to be to meet my financial objectives? So don't lose sight of the performance characteristics of that system. Now, there's other systems maybe we can look at to get bigger parts of the move or other parts of the move, or how many of those were just re-entry issues that just reliably capturing a quarter? How much can you carry anyway? It's the dollars at risk per trade, not your total maximum efficiency. You know, efficiency at capturing the whole move is one interesting well, I actually would like to have less efficiency, not more efficiency, because that tells me there's an awful lot more gold in the mine. Feeling the 1R loss is like a vitamin that the more you take, the better you get. Uh, because any exit better than a 1R loss is a win. What about, how good does that feel? I, I've already felt the one our loss. I can handle that. I got a thick skin. I'm a rhino. Uh, yeah, need to spend more time on that. The feeling the one our loss instantly. Feeling the one our loss before you even put the trade on. And you say, nevertheless, I'm going to put the trade on. I know that as soon as I put this chip down, I'm already going to feel the one our loss. Think of the joyful anticipation of that. And then do it anyway. It's good for you. Take your goddamn medicine. You know, eat your corn. Eat your spinach. Yeah, creativity begets creativity. Uh, I also look at it, you know, from, you know, the motto of the French Foreign Legion, march or die. Uh, okay. They, they, let, they just put that to, the sergeant doesn't have a lot of time to persuade you about anything. It's just, they're in a tough spot. They know it. They signed up for it. And the, that's the motto of the Legion, march or die. And you decide. Yeah, creativity works in both ways. You know, when you aren't doing the work to get more creative, you should be accumulating anxiety about it. Man, where is that spark? You need to have that spark all the time so that you know the engine is running and it's warmed up and ready to go. So when you hit the afterburner, it's ready to go because it's already running and idling along. I don't have the startup cost. That's why we leave the, the diesel engine running all the time. It's just cheaper, but you also know that it's working. 
Um, so when you come home and you take off that armor metaphorically and hang it up, you can do that because your, your home is your armor, right? So draw the picture of what that safe space is, your base camp and that sanctuary and all the things that you do in there. That's that you'll see this in the house of trading visualization that we do in the foundations and in here somewhere. We're, we're going to do that here. So that's where you're preparing in a safe space to do the work that you, that you got to do in your, you have a training room, a ready room, a library, a meditation room, the community room, your rest area, your entertainment center, the equipment room, the film room, that and then you cross that threshold to go down the hall of champions out onto the playing field. Uh, so draw when we get to that, let's start thinking about what that metaphor is. You don't have to do it right now, but that we're going to ask you at some point to draw that. But that's safety, trust, truth, transformation. I'm thinking about the guy that I trained with that had the, he got his black belt faster than anybody. He came in as a white belt, and what he did every lesson, every session, uh, during Randori, which is free play, I throw you, we throw, you throw me, bow, next. Uh, he would go to every black belt, throw and be thrown, bow, go to that, and just go from black belt to black belt, just getting thrown, 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 thrown trying his best, doing his thing, learning from each speed run. One, you know, one minute throw, speed run. And he, for 60 minutes, he'd get thrown a hundred times and throw a hundred times. And then you realize that uh, when you're throwing a guy, it's the same as doing a break fall when you're being thrown. It's the same body motion. Like if I'm going to do a standing shoulder roll, I relax and exhale and I bend forward and I just put my body into an arc and I like a wagon wheel. So it hits the back of my wrist, forearm, upper arm, across my shoulders. Exhale as I hit the ground and then land on my feet ready to go. That's a break fall. That's how you fall without getting hurt. A shoulder throw is nothing more than getting into a guy's space, loading him up on you, and then do a shoulder roll with him on your back. And you land on top of him like a bag of wet sand. And that's the end of him. You know? Uh, so that one-minute training finding those limits, total immersion therapy. You afraid of snakes? Handle a, a million snakes safely. Right, just go handle snakes. Start with a picture of a snake, then a rubber snake, then safe snake, baby snakes, then safe snakes. Decide where you're going to stop on the progression to handling rattlesnakes. Don't handle rattlesnakes. Leave the snakes alone, but don't get over the fear of them. Be alert when you're walking through the field. Uh, you could wear uh, uh, Teflon gaiters if you're in rattlesnake country. Don't get bit by snakes. They give you every chance to get the hell away. Except pythons in the Everglades, I th it seems that they're coming after you. So. Hey, so I get paid to be wrong a lot for discovery learning. I get paid to be wrong, finding all the things that don't work. I know why they don't work, and I know all I have to do to make it work by finding that limit. So I get paid to, I get paid to be wrong a lot, and sometimes I make money. Uh, there are three buckets in the histogram of your results when you're working on the data. Bucket number one the most important bucket is no losses worse than minus one. That's one bucket. When you look in that bucket, it should be empty. 
That's what I'm looking for is nothing. Bucket number two is the space between minus one and plus two. That bucket, when you pull that bucket out and dump it out, it should have positive expectancy. That's all. I don't care if it takes a thousand trades or, you know, that bucket should have positive expectancy. That's how you take care of business. Bucket number three are the trades greater than 2R. I'd like to have something in that bucket. Those are your three standards. If you do those, if you have those three buckets, then you have a sustainable growing system. Nothing in bucket one, positive expectancy in bucket two, something in bucket three. The ratio does not matter. The bucket is the bucket. And there's different activities that you take with each bucket. If there's something in bucket one, stop that. You, you got to break down in your rule somewhere. Uh, if you look at the swing trading on 30 minutes, every time I make a decision to hold overnight, uh, I'm get, I had a I got some things in bucket one. I just have to eat that cost of doing business. That's the difference between being perfect and making money. I just know that I'm going to have something. My intention is to have nothing in that bucket. So when I take that risk, it's with full knowledge. At, on that system, what I got to do is take a look at bucket one and bucket three. Does bucket three pay for bucket one? Yeah, done. Done and one. So remember those three buckets. Uh, using willpower to do the right thing is what wears you out because that's an active verb. I have to make so many decisions in order to commit my willpower to do something. It's exhausting. Unthinking action is the easiest. So now what I got to do is convert correct intentional action to unthinking action so that I'm not thinking in the trade. And that's what the flight simulator will do for you is it allows you to do routine things routinely. And your monitor, your manager, your flight supervisor, your flight plan keeps you on that part of the flight path where you can, where it's just routine things routinely by knowing where those layers of boundaries are and stay out of the bad weather. Don't fly through a thunderstorm unless you have to. Yeah, not only does the market not care about your plan, it can't because it doesn't even think about you at all because that's not what it does. The market is pure execution. You know, and that's one way to get over the feel. You know, other people's feel. You're worried about what they think about you, dude. They don't think about you at all. <laughs> if we're being honest. <laughs> hey, so I was. Uh, uh, I'm in some hybrid course university where I'm. We're learning learning how to do hybrid courses, and I'm participating in there. And so some gal asked for help. She said, "Hey." She's, she's looking at uh, public speaking and she's trying to do a feelings inventory about what kind of feelings have people had in the past and the present associated with public speaking, you know, fear, excitement or whatever. And what did you do about it? So I, I answered her questionnaire and then she was very grateful. And she sent me a note back and said, if you don't mind, uh, what have you done with those feelings? And do you, were they from the past or the present? What, what did you do about them to fix them or overcome those feelings? And so my note back to her instantly was uh, all of those feelings that I listed are past, present, and future. I don't try to get over them or eliminate them. Instead, I move towards them 
and embrace them with gratitude. I just use the energy and the information they contain to give me the energy to do my life's purposeful work. Done in one. That's my emotional state management. That's how much I worry about the emotions. I move towards them, embrace them, feel them, use the energy for my life work. I mean, is there anything else you could even do about them? I don't think so. Oh, well, I suppose you could change human nature and your entire bio-emotional cognitive wiring. Let me know how that goes. Just embrace them, feel them, move on. Use your brain to establish the boundaries. Use your gut to help you understand where those emotionally charged boundaries are. And then use your flight simulator to refine purposeful action and do routine things routinely so you can bring home the bacon, so you can bring home wheelbarrows full of acorns. You're going to eat some acorns, you're going to make acorn pie, and you're going to plant some acorns to grow more oak trees. You know, we just did our taxes yesterday, and the uh, state of Kansas does not uh, tax my military retirement, and so uh, I get a healthy refund every year from the state of Kansas uh, on my taxes. I think it was like uh, two grand. And so I just convert the two grand of Kansas state tax refund into all their little state sponsored charities. Like they have the chickadee check off the meals for wheels for seniors and support the arts and all that. And I just, you know, preserve the wildlife, whatever. So whatever I, I figure that's just my relationship with the state of Kansas. Hey, you don't, you don't tax my military retirement. I want to live here. And to show my gratitude, Kansas, all the money that you saved me by not taxing my military retirement, I'm just going to give to you to do all the other good things and good decisions you make, like Meals on Wheels and all that stuff. So uh, I just have to hide that number sometimes from my wife because she's <laughs> – I better not put that on the recording because she squeezes every nickel. But I will not tolerate any discussion on that point. <laughs> uh, so that's my that's my relationship with the state of Kansas. So in that above my shoulder there, you see the mill house there, the mill and grinding. That mill, the whole village put together and lifted the millstone up there, and it grinds all of the grain, all of the acorns into meal or whatever. It grinds the grain, and uh, and it's right next to that unending water supply, the limitless water supply coming down from the mountains. Some goes into the cistern, some is agri, you know, flooding the fields. Some of that water evaporates to go back up into the mountains for rain and snow. The water cycle, you know, but you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do something to grind. You you gotta. Uh, do that well. All right, that's uh, that's my work in progress for this week. I, I actually it wasn't. That's my response to you. So my work in progress is to figure out this uh, this trading program, uh, sustainable trading program, and um, got a kid from Ohio State University, doctoral student of Angus Fletcher's, and we're going to make him an intern, uh, and he's going to create the pieces and parts of the sustainable coaching program so that he can um, add his storytelling expertise in there. But this we'll get the, I'm writing the certification program for facilitators. He's going to help to deliver it. And we're working with Boji uh, as the senior professor emeritus of true storytelling. So uh, I've taken on that, that task to, uh, to describe and, and to implement a certification program for true storytelling facilitators. And the guiding principle of that one is, look, there's a lot of storytelling in the world. How do you know that you are in a true storytelling circle? What is the interrogation at the board? What does the border guard inspection checklist look like? How do you know 
that you're going into a true storytelling circle. It's, well, it's based on those agreements. So a facilitator has to have the, the demonstrated skills to be able to adhere to that. Like I was able to self-regulate and not answer Ken's question as soon as he asked. But to me, the answer is establish the, the border guard between the three-minute domain and the 30-minute domain and think about what that guy is asking you to say. What's your business in here? <laughs> you know, <laughs> And pay the cover charge or whatever. And then that'll answer all your questions uh, until the next until next week, anyway. Uh, all right, I'm going to hit the tones. I'm going to ask you to think about the um, word and listen for the word that comes bubbling up, and we'll go around the horn. And, um, uh, and then complete our our business there so really good work today guys I'm always thinking about you know how to snip our individual testimonies to share with other people that need to hear it and they're all always so good that I always I say, well let me just send everything because it's because <laughs> individual pieces are so dang good anyway here we go I should say, like, to, to eat my own cooking, uh, that's my problem. That's the problem I want to have. So, you know, now i got to do something with it. So, so that, that's how that sounds. Preparation. Jeff. Work. Ken. Uh, dig. Chun Long. Self coaching. Well, in the spirit of the circle, uh, grinding. <laughs> I thought this was supposed to be creativity and fun and joy. <laughs> it gives you the energy and the alert. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, yeah, just one last thing to share with you guys. You know, um, what a terrible self-coach I realized I was. And uh, the benefit of this course is these things have always been going on, but I never had this level of awareness of what was going on before. So that's a game changer because when you realize it, you can you have an opportunity to change. But Somewhere in the last two weeks, my other system, my other trading system that is still running in its own account, and it takes about 15 minutes a day for me to handle it, um, produced the largest single day of all of 2022 and year to date 2023. So all the other parts of me wanted to celebrate this, right? Because this is an outlier positive day. And the trader part of me or the coach part of me was like, no, 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 you get, got to get back into this these results on this one minute chart, you know, we're not celebrating today. And that was a, was a huge aha moment for me. I was like, wait a minute, why are we even doing this? You know, so the realization that I'm, I'm not being a generous, productive self coach allows me the opportunity to do better. Right. So but it was amazing that I didn't feel happy about that. I didn't feel as happy about the win as I did about my perceived shortfalls on the other thing. So that was really eye-opening to me. I hope. You know, I mean, the manager's allowed to enjoy the moment, too, when the, his team lifts the cup, but it's that vicarious satisfaction. When you just when you watch Jurgen Klopp, you know, uh, or Pep, or even Mourinho. I mean, I don't know if he ever enjoyed it, but, I, you know, when those guys just lift, it's, you know, what they've done for the team 
is their satisfaction when they get to see their players and their fans enjoy that. You know, it's all for the city, you know. Uh, so you're allowed to do that, but then it's right back to work. Even as he's enjoying that, he's already thinking about the next training session. So that's just, it comes with the territory. But you're allowed to feel some of that joy and the joy feeling part of you, you know. Going. Yeah, Ken. Yeah, um, yeah. It's just um, uh, about the, about the uh, Ten Hag. So, sorry to the people who don't follow soccer, but Ten Hag is the is the, is the manager of Man United, and and after the loss, uh, after that, uh, you know, I noted how many times he was saying we just have to reset. And he kept saying reset, and it you know it's the, it's the elite mentality, it's the same that we use yep. for you know to to get back to the zero state and then in trading, exactly the same. He said you know we had a good season up to then, you know, it's just one game, it's one arc. Yeah, let's, one let's, arc. let's get back, let's get back to it, you know. This I start, I'm starting to really appreciate how, you know, this mentality and the the elite eliteness of of it all, you know, uh, since doing trading and and and, and learning yeah. about it. That's quite amazing. Yeah, everybody, everybody that's outside of that world thinks it's about the money because mm. the money is so large, and in their world, that money is large. Uh, inside the elites, the money is given, but it's the opportunity to, you know, walk through fire, you know, with your guys and come out the other end, knowing that you're going to get burned at times and you're going to step on a just... But just that peak experience is what pulls them into that, to come, to find out, to express themselves. You always hear, you know, Pep and Klopp uh, and Arteta, express yourself. Guys, get out on that field and express yourself. Enjoy the game. Let the joy you feel about that game communicate to the people and you're doing it for them so that they can feel that and you're taking all the risk and the fans that are true fans know that because they just they know what you're doing for them for the city and when you watch some of those old the documentaries about you know Southampton and uh, you know the Hammers and you guys they haven't won the league in a while that they want to see their boys competing, you know, holding up our name, go into battle for us and take your lumps and go for it. Let them know they were in a fight. You know, that's a, some of that spirit helps you shift to what really matters. And yeah, the reset is the, it's a one hour loss. And that's not nothing. It's something, but it's information, you know? Yeah. I hope. And on, uh, sorry if I might just yeah. add something else. So I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, Jeff talked about you know, Poland, so it's kind of, a, and I live in an area, kind of a Polish area. Um, uh, so in, in World War Two, I mean, we get the idea, as, especially in Britain, that, you know, the Spitfire is the plane, you know, that. that. But if you've seen, I don't know if you've seen the, the movie, the Hurricane, it's called Hurricane. That's and, the plane. Uh, that's the plane and that that plane you know they flew that plane and it doesn't get as much you know uh, uh what a recognition probably as as, uh, as as the spitfire and also very interestingly that that squadron the polish squadron i think had the best uh was one of the most efficient in, in kill kill rates or kill ratio yeah and they were much more experienced uh pilots uh, than than the the, the, the i suppose the english ones because the english were like 17 year old you know, with hardly any flying time, and uh, you, you probably you you and uh, Ken and Jeff only knows it better than I do. But sometimes it's it's just funny how you don't kind of you know there are things that until you look into them, you, you kind of go with some you know the public perception that you know the the Battle of Britain were won by seventeen year olds. But if you dig deeper, it's actually you know, the experienced guys and Polish guys who actually never got the recognition they they deserve. So. Anyway, that's mine. I hope. <laughs> yeah, I sent you the. I sent you guys that link to uh, that channel. It's called uh, 
uh, Greg's Airplanes and Automobiles. He's got a beautiful uh, video on the Hurricanes and the Spitfires and the P-40, you know, and the, uh, you know, the P-51 was nothing with the Allison engine until they put the Merlin in it, um, you know. But the P the P forty seven that the whole series he does on the P forty seven man, and then go to its uh, little brother, you know the A ten Warthog. That's the plane. You know. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, so you know the, those arguments happen. They've been happening since the first since the second plane was built, right? Which one right. is? Yeah. And. Uh, the truth is bigger than that, and it applies to life and trading. The truth is it took all of those planes working together yeah. to win the war, and it took all of those pilots. The, the Poles were way more experienced because they had been in the war for years before Britain entered the world, war, and, and the U.S. was the last to join. But it took all of those people working together and all of those planes, and it took all of that to win the war, right? So the argument about which one was best or most valuable, it's kind of a moot point. And today, you know, two friends of mine are A-10 pilots and, you know, they will, uh, they'll tell you all the good things about an A-10 and I'm a fan too, but without the guys on the ground, the A-10's not worth much, right? If it can't get refueled, and this is something I bring up to my guys all the time about their care and treatment of our ground support personnel, because I've actually fired a couple of pilots for mistreating the people that support us because with if we can't get fueled and we can't get reloaded we're dead in the water our value goes to zero very quickly it's and the crew it's the crew that. chief's airplane you just flying it <laughs> right i hope yeah great great session today guys i i'm gonna have to watch the replay i've learned not to try to take notes in the moment because i don't get just a fraction of it but well just think it's the it's the it's the uh, open pit excavation the industrial right. strength mine you got to go and mine you, the video for all the good one that... truck one truckload at a time and you're building that mountain but if you ever despair just look at the pyramids and then go look at those great big open pit mines out in Cal Colorado and whatnot uh, and just set persistence you know I right, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit it too we're getting ready to go eat some brunch uh always good to see you guys and uh we're, we'll pull this one to a session with some gratitude and forgiveness and uh i think i think we're gonna do uh wednesday night instead of tuesday we got such a long drive to pittsburgh not sure what time we're gonna get there and i'd rather do it deliberately at seven on wednesday than tuesday if you're uh i'll put that note out as well um uh, so don't look for the replay on Wednesday rather than Tuesday. But this one will be up shortly. Well done, and take good care. Go United. Ciao. <laughs>